Your church can be dismissed, and I know there's a small number there. Uh, it'll be the, the younger ones probably going, so. And then I invite you to open your Bibles, please, to Colossians chapter 3. We'll read the first, three, the first four verses here in a moment. But Colossians chapter 3 and uh, those first. How many of you remember as kids looking at the Children's Highlights magazine? Yeah, okay. Pretty popular magazine. I remember finding it in the school library. And, and uh, I remember one of my favorite things was to find those hidden pictures. Remember that kind of thing? Remember those kind of things? And oh, back up a little bit there. Yeah, the, on the left there. I, uh, do you see all the, on the bottom? There's all sorts of things that are in that picture. That's kind of typical of those, wasn't it? And then uh, on the right, you know what that picture is? That, uh, that was, that's one of those magic eye pictures. Do uh, you know what? This is a picture of Jesus, by the way. I figured that was real, tip, real uh, appropriate for our... You don't see it? <laughs> uh, I, I remember looking at those in the newspaper on, uh, it used to come in the Sunday newspaper and you, you'd have to get your right up there till you almost went cross-eyed and then you start bringing it back and then a picture appears. You, you, yeah, yeah, some of you remember that kind of thing. Well, uh, this morning I brought a, uh, I brought a, what do you see here? It's a small one, I know. Barb's saying, you took that off the wall this morning? <laughs> can you see a horse? Yeah. Okay, yeah, you can. Okay. Uh, this is a Bev Doodle, Doolittle print. And uh, how many horses do you see on that one on the wall there? On the, on the PowerPoint? Yeah. She, yeah. Okay, yeah. All right, good. You're looking, you're looking. And uh, can you see the horse there? Okay, yeah, all right. And uh, so there's the idea of these, these hidden pictures, that kind of thing. Uh, now, tell me how many people you see in the next picture. How many people do you see? You see three, do you? Aha, uh -huh. there it is, yep. All right, go back once again there, if you would, and show the other one. Now you can't help but see the embryo, right? You can't help but see it. Uh, uh, you know, and so you didn't know she was pregnant. Yeah, right? And uh, anyway, the idea of these, the idea of a hidden picture and that kind of thing, I, it seems like a lot of these uh, masters at the hidden art, they almost don't want you to see the picture. It's almost like, you, you know, they don't want you to find it, but that's not the case with God. And we're going to find in our context here that our life is hid in Christ or with Christ in God. We're going to see that's going to be a, a key in the first verse we're going to look at today. And so we need to, and, and I don't know, just that thought of that, there's, just, uh, there's a lot that maybe we could draw out of this, but that sense that we are, our life is hid with Christ in God, and that ought to make a difference in our lives. That ought to make a difference, not just that we know it, but that we, we really see what we're talking about in the context here. And so let's just take a look and read this ver these verses. Go back to chapter 3, go back to verse 1. If then you were raised with Christ, were you? Who was? Okay, we'll touch on it. Seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above. And we mentioned that is an emphasis. Set your mind is the one Greek word, think. Think things above. And notice, not on things on the earth. For you died. When was that? For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. And so this is just a fantastic passage that we're looking at here. But uh, when, we, when we look at the context, you, you see that we were raised in verse 1, and then we died in verse 3. You're, you're, there's both dead, death and resurrection there. And uh, 
And, and we need to understand both of those ideas. And both of those ideas, he builds truth on understanding those basic, simple truths that you died with Christ, that you were raised with Christ. We're going to build on that kind of an idea. And you noticed in verse, in verse uh, 2, verse 1 and 2, if the resurrection was true, that there, it demanded a response of seeking things above and thinking things above. And that's what we touched on last week. And so there's a response when you understand biblical truth, it ought to come out in some kind of a response in your life uh, in, in living the Christian life. And so notice at the end of verse 2, he says, seek or set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. That's still part of the command, not things on earth. In other words, don't have your thinking geared everything here. You ought to be thinking above. Don't get tangled up, tangled up with earthly things. And so as a, as a result, we come back to our position in Christ that we were raised with Christ and we died with Christ, especially as you pick up in verse 3. And so it, uh, I titled verse 3 or the, that your position is now wrapped up in Christ. And when we say position in Christ, we're talking about how God sees us. God sees us as raised with him. God sees us as, as having died with Christ. That's how God views us. That's the truth, and that's the reality of every believer. If you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, his death counts for your death. His resurrection is your resurrection. And you, because we're so united with him. And so as we pick up in verse, in verse three, he's, he's saying, he's building on that command, don't think things on the earth, think things above, for. And it's not really the word because, but it's, it has that sense. For you died. For you died. And uh, when we think about you died, it's death with Christ. It's the... It's, when I look at the grammar, it's an accomplished fact. It's an accomplished fact. It's done. You died. And, it's, and, and so we as believers ought to look at this as our spiritual reality. As a spiritual reality, this is how God sees us. Christ's death was your death. You died with Christ. And uh, it's our position in Christ that we died with him. And this isn't the only place we see this. We saw it already in chapter 2 and verse 20. And uh, I'm, I'm going to deal with these three verses again. But I want to remind you, the chapter, chapter 2 and verse 20 said, we died to the law. That was, again, being identified with Christ. In uh, Romans 6, 2 and 3, it tells us we died to sin. We died to sin. In, uh, in Galatians 2.20, we were co-crucified with Christ. We died with Christ. We were crucified with him. In other words, we're so united with Christ that his death is our death. And that happens the moment we trust Christ as, 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 as salvation. You know, we're identified with him. And so... Whatever, whatever is applied to him applies to us. His death applies to us. And uh, I, I think a lot of times in, in religion, in religion, we'll hear a lot of emphasis on what, what we need to do. But there is, there is no way that you are going to live for Christ or serve Christ without understanding the foundation and the security that we have of being identified with Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. In fact, there's, there's some teaching out there that talks about the, the death, burial, and resurrection and how the importance in our Christian life. And, and they say, you know, it, it'll probably take you maybe years to really get a handle on that in your spiritual life to apply that. It'll, it'll possibly take years to really let that sink in and be a rea reality in your life. And uh, yet, yet, as I look at this context here, these guys understood it. These guys understood it. So, but at the moment of salvation, 
Christ's death is applied to me. At the moment of salvation, the Holy Spirit baptizes me into Christ, into the body of Christ. And it's the work of God. It's the work of the Spirit of God. It's not the work of man. It's not, it's, uh, you know, I, I get so frustrated when, when uh, people take plain truth like 1 Corinthians 12, 13, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, and they start applying water there. Come on, people. It says the spirit baptizes you into the body. It's not a man baptizing you into water. And uh, several other places, it, 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 it aggravates me when the clear, clear scripture is just twisted, and uh, we grab one little thing and, and take it out of context. John Piper has a quote there that I shared with you on your notes here. What happened to Christ Jesus historically and finally and unchangeably, yeah, what happened to Christ historic, uh, and to us in him, you get that? It happened to us in him is applied to us. What happened to Christ is applied to us. And it's, that's our position. It, and when I've talked about our position in the past I've used the five vowels of assurance it is absolutely irrevocably unchangeably eternally ours the, the, this position is ours in Christ that Christ's death applies his resurrection applies and it's, it's God's account of our spiritual reality when he said you died you died that's the reality. What he doesn't do is apply it all in, at length here, but we'll look at some other passages. And, uh, you know, as, as I mentioned earlier, some people believe that it takes, it takes a lot of time for a believer to really get this and apply that in their lives. And uh, it got me thinking about these Colossians. These guys, these guys had never met Paul, generally, for the most part. They'd never met Paul. And so how in the world did they understand this truth? Paul's just writing as if it's just taken for granted. They know that they died with Christ. They know that they're raised. And they ought to respond to that. Well, it evidently was the teaching of Epaphras or Epaphras. Can't remember how to pronounce it in the Greek. But anyway, back in chapter 1 and verse 7, this guy, this guy evidently taught them this truth. And so Paul had never been there. Paul had never taught them. But Epaphras and maybe a few buddies came back and said, hey, we learned the grace of God in truth. We learned this. And they come back and they share this. And so Paul writes to them, having heard of how well they're doing. And he said, these guys are getting it. You know, I've been asked many a time. And sometimes it's casual. Sometimes it's preacher talk or whatever. I've been asked, how is the church doing? You know, what do you say? Sometimes people are asking us like, hi, how are you? And you don't even, you know, you answer fine. You know, you know, that kind of thing. So, uh, and, and so I, I got thinking, you know, what should I say? Then? Should I be, shouldn't I be able to say the next time that, uh, the next time that someone asks me, how's the church doing? Shouldn't I be able to say, well, my people understand their completeness position in Christ. I wonder, wonder how someone would respond to that. And then I got thinking, how do I know that you know? Just because I taught it doesn't mean you got it, right? <laughs> Is that, I mean, I've been teaching this, you know, and we, we had that whole emphasis on completeness in chapter two. You know, how's the church doing? So I figured, you know what? In order to be answer, answer honestly, I'm gonna give you a little quiz right now. You know, how many of you are shrinking down? I wish I wasn't here. <laughs> uh, but uh, number one, you know, because I want to be honest when I say I want, the church is doing great because they understand their completeness in Christ and are applying it in their lives. See, that's what I want to say. Number one, true or false? See, I'm making it easy on you. True or false? Everyone believing the gospel is in Christ. Yeah, true, loud, nice and loud, good, good, because we want to get it on the, on the recording here because I wouldn't want to be turned out into a liar, see. All right, number two, our position is that we died, were buried, and raised with Christ. 
All right, good. Now be careful, because there's a false one coming up, but not, uh, don't, don't just say true like the little kids in, in yeah, what's the answer? Jesus, you know, anyway. Uh, number three, true or false? Position refers to how God views us in Christ. Yes, very good, true, yes. Uh, I knew that, I just said something like that, so I'm glad you got it. All right, uh, number four. Our position in Christ depends on our faith and our actions. Oh, oh way to go. <laughs> I want the world to know, and here it's going on on the internet right now, that my people understand that salvation is by grace and it's not a part of works. Amen. Yeah. It's by grace we're saved and it's, and it's not works and our position in Christ is not dependent on True or false, number five. Our position in Christ is absolutely unchangeable and irrevocable. True. And number six, being we all sin, it must be inevitable and part of our position in Christ. That was a hard one, huh? Being we all, is, is sin a part of our position? It really isn't part of our position. No, it's what we experience. But yeah, so maybe my wording wasn't so good on that. So shh, don't tell anybody on that. No, <laughs> anyway. No, but yeah, so you tell, you know, you're saying you're in Christ. You're saying that you understand that. You're saying that you're secure in Christ. That's what you're saying with those things. And uh, it reminded me, it reminded me that uh, I know this coming Saturday as we share the gospel in the tent at the fair, I know we're going to find dozens, if not, if not 20s and 30s and 40 kids and teens and adults who cannot, who are not confident like you were confident on some of these. There will be people who are not confident of their, of their salvation. You know, and, and uh, if we just ask the blunt question, are you going to heaven when you die? Well, I hope so. That's generally the answer you get. That's generally the answer you get and I know we have opportunity there to encourage people, if you're trusting Jesus Christ as, as your Savior, then you're guaranteed eternal life. Why can I say that? Because we have this position in Christ. We're identified with Christ completely. And I know we're going to face that. And, uh, you know, when we talk about salvation by grace through faith, we talk about well, that, that means security, doesn't it? So you got salvation, you got security. Where does that come from? It comes from our sovereign God. It comes from the scripture. And it comes and it encourages us to serve. It's just, this is just the building block of serving. And it, and it ties in with our five S's that we've been reviewing at different times. So I want to encourage you. And uh, interestingly... Interestingly, I know I'm not alone in, in uh, seeing the importance of this identity position. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, listen to this quote. Understanding what it means to be crucified with Christ is perhaps the most important of all principles for believers. To be crucified with Christ, that co-crucifixion. And he goes on. Until we are free from the bondage of sin, we will never be free to serve God. Isn't that a good thought? He emphasizes the importance that this is an important truth because ultimately you'll never serve God without it. I've been saying for years, you can't serve God unless you're secure in Christ. Otherwise, you're going to serve to get something from God. So we, we serve God because we're secure we don't serve to get something. We serve because we have something. And I pray that that encourages your heart. So anyway, what if someone asks you, well, how's Community Bible Church doing? We, well, we, we're missing a lot of people this week and we just had, you know, we could whine. No. Part of the reason we're missing people is because people are serving the Lord. People are going to get encouraged in the Lord. Yeah, some people are on vacation. Hallelujah. I pray they're a testimony where they are. But the emphasis, the emphasis is that, that we understand and we know and we appreciate the completeness we have in Christ. We appreciate our position that is un, undeniable, unwavering.
So let's go on to the next point. He says, your life is hidden in Christ. Your life is hidden in Christ. And so right after that blunt statement where he makes, you died, then he says, you have life. Your life is hidden. It's wrapped up in Christ. You died with Christ, but your life is wrapped up in him. And uh, I don't know, what, what, kind of, what do you really think about? Your life is, your life is hidden in him. I, you know, it's, it's kind of crazy language, isn't it? Your life is hidden. It's wrapped up in him. It's tied up. What are we saying there? What are people going to see when they see you then? Hmm. I did, just a lot of thoughts went through my, what does this look like? Your life is wrapped up in him. Of course, we're speaking in spiritual terms here. Your life is spiritually wrapped up in him because you died. But it really reminded me of those same verses that we looked at before. Look back at chapter 2 and verse 20 in this, in this book. And uh, notice it says, Therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, why as though living in the world? Notice he brings in, why, and he bring, why live like you're connected to the world? Or we bring it over to our text. He says, uh, you know, don't think things on the earth because you died. But then he says, your life, your life is wrapped up in Christ. It's hid in him. Uh, turn with me to Romans chapter 6 briefly. Thinking along the same lines of, uh, of the idea of being, the idea of dying with Christ. And I, I want to go through the chapter a little more, but I want to pick up in verse 4 briefly. Therefore, Romans 6, 4. Therefore, we were buried with him through the baptism into death. Again, this is not water. You put water here. I said it a few weeks ago. You put water here, you're all wet. This is the baptism into the death. That at just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. He's talking about new life, resurrection type life. That's what he's talking about. But go back with me to verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace might abound? That's the question on the table. Shall we sin? And he says, certainly not, verse 2. How shall we who, who died to sin live any longer in it? We died to sin. If we look at these verses that, that we give you here, I mean, we, we died and yet we still live. We died and we have new life. Anyway, how did, the, how did we die? Well, he explains it in verse three. Or did you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? And again, not water. He's not talking about water here. He's talking about, and so this word baptism has the idea of being identified with. Just like in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, where it says uh, uh, Israel was baptized into Moses in the water, in the sea, and in the cloud. Hmm. In other words, it, it doesn't mean, did they get wet when they went through the sea? No. You know, did they get wet in the cloud? No. It's nothing about water. It's about being identified with. It's just like our passage. Being identified with, being identified with Christ. We're co-crucified with him. We'll get there next, but anyway. We're baptized into his death. Uh, that's what he's saying. And so therefore, the result is you ought to walk like you got his life. You got death and you got life. We got death on the cross. We got resurrection from the tomb. And that is ours. That is applied to us. I think, I think the reason a lot of Christians don't get this principle of being identified with Christ is because they start putting water in a place like this. Anyway, enough, enough discussion on that. And I got good Baptist friends, by the way, who would agree with me in this context. So it's, I'm, I'm not just out here on a limb. Skip down with me a little bit to verse 11. In verse 11, he summarizes this chapter and he says, Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin. 
you count it to be real. The word reckon there is a mathematical type term. Add it up. Add it up. And if we add it up, we will know that we've been identified with Christ's death completely. We've been identified with his resurrection. And that's what he's really saying. By faith, you add it up and you count yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's all wrapped up about being in him. And then come on back and stop at Galatians 2.20. I'll just read it for you here on our way back. But notice you got death and life. They're ours in Christ. It's part of our position. It's unchangeable. It's immovable. It's ours in Christ. But Galatians 2.20, and it says, I have been crucified, co-crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live, notice, co-crucified, and the life I now live, this life is the life that's hidden in God. But he says, the life which I now live, I live, uh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And the, the idea, the emphasis is the faith of the Son of God. Be careful about some of the newer translations by the faith in the Son of God. Yes, we have faith in Christ. We're not denying that. But this is talking about the work of God, the faith of, the faithfulness of Christ. He is the one in whom we're hid, and our, and our life is going to be his life. Anyway, we have no life. We know, have no life except of Christ. And our life is hid in him. Spiritually speaking, that ought to be the only visible life. Isn't that something to think about? The only life that ought to be seen is Christ's life. How are we doing on that? Moving on into verse 4. Your position will be revealed with Christ. Man, I, I, knew, I, I knew we wouldn't get any further than this verse. When we start talking about the Christ appearing, let me just read it again. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Christ, our life. You know the first thing I noticed here? He changed pronouns. Some of you teachers might recognize that. But he went from you, you, you to our life. I think Paul wants them to know that I'm in this with you. This Christ is our life. He's the focus and center of our, of our, our well-being. But when Christ, who is our life, wow. What, what, you know, what does that say to you? When Christ is our life, when Christ, our life, will appear. And uh, when that word for appearing there gives me two points of grammar, one of them is that it's accomplished and the other like a single event, and the other is that God caused it to happen. Whenever God causes it to happen, then, then Christ will appear. Remember how the disciples asked, asked uh, oh, when are you going to come? It's in the Father's hands, all right? And the same thing is true for this coming, that it's in the Father's hands. I, I heard it not too long ago. I happened to bump into, I don't know if it was a radio or Christian TV, and somebody was alluding to Matthew 24, 14 uh, and saying that, well, the Lord's going to come when the gospel gets preached everywhere. When the gospel gets preached everywhere. And that's the gist of what that verse says. But that is not talking about the coming for us. In the context here, he is talking to people who are, are a part of the body of Christ. And we who are in the body of Christ have a unique coming that is not the coming that Jesus talked about. In Matthew 24, he talked about the coming to the earth. In Paul's epistles, we find a coming that's a meeting of the Lord in the air. Uh, I drew a picture. This is the secret coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. First Thessalonians 4 is so 
clear on that. But uh, go to the next one there, please, Micah. And just our simple dispensational understanding here. We live in the dispensation of grace. I circled it with our blue, the blue circle there. And uh, when we look at the idea of our, of, uh, on the right-hand side of, the, of grace, we have a coming in the air. The arrow goes up. We meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. That is the coming that we have to be talking about here. He's not talking about a coming for the kingdom uh, when he comes to set up his kingdom, where he comes to the earth and the Mount of Olives splits and etc. And he begins the kingdom. This is the unique coming that we call, often call the rapture, uh, but it's the rapture of the church, the body of Christ. And so he says, when Christ will appear, when Christ appears, this is the coming for grace saints. And, uh, you know, understanding, understanding the grace dispensation helps us understand, really, the entire Bible. You know, so I know when I read about the coming in Matthew, I know this mystery coming is not about us. You know, it's not about this mystery coming. But when I read Paul's epistles and he talks about the appearing, or, I, or he talks about the coming, I know that is referring to us as he's addressing, as he's addressing believers who live today in the dispensation of grace. And so we read, we can understand the entire Bible. We understand who we are. You know that other saints in other dispensations did not have this position in Christ. They did not have that same position. They didn't have that same assurance and security that we have. But we know what we have this in Christ. We know who we are. We know what we're to do. We know where we're going. And right in our context, we saw you, if you were raised with Christ, seek those things above. Set your affections on, on things, things above, not on things of the earth, because your life is hid in Christ, who is going to appear. Right in our section, you have who we are, what we're to do, and where we're going. Right in these four verses, we have just a, a sample of that same idea. And so when he says, your, your, your life then will appear with Christ. You're going to appear with him. You know, at the time God causes Christ to appear, he's going to cause us to appear with him. You know, and, and, and I think it's such a, I don't know, it just blends together in my mind. It was, see, if, if our life is just wrapped up in Christ, if we're hidden in Christ, then when he appears, we got to, it's got to be us too. We got to be there. And uh, in this case, we're going to appear. And uh, there's several thoughts I had in this. And one of them is just that, that when, when Christ appears, we'll appear. In a sense, we should be so hidden behind Christ that Christ ought to be so, you know, Christ ought to be what's seen in our life. But we ought to be so hidden behind Christ. Then when, when we appear with him, it, it'll be, oh, yeah. <laughs> it'll be kind of a, kind of an aha moment. Oh yeah. Our life was hidden Christ. And so when he appears, we're going to appear and boom. But it all comes back and it's all rests upon our position with him. And that position is eternal. And notice that last, that, that phrase, you are, and I put it, your life will appear and will be with him. Your, your life will be in glory. Uh, let me read the verse again. Just to, When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. We will appear in glory. And when we think about glory, yes, we, we can say heaven is glory. But I think this is more than that. We're going to appear in heaven because God is going to give us a glorified body. I'd like you to take a look back at Philippians chapter 3 with me. You know, this, this, and I think sometimes we don't think, we don't think in the same way that God reveals his truth, but these bodies, these bodies that we live in today aren't fit for heaven. Can't go. You know, we say, yeah, I'm going to heaven someday. 
but not in this body. It won't be exactly like this. It can't. And uh, it's not that the clouds won't hold us. <laughs> That's not what I'm saying, you know. Uh, and I, 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 got, I got thinking about, uh, I remember one time as a kid, I've seen it in both Minnesota and Alaska, uh, walking on like floating bogs. And uh, you, you got to watch where you step and uh, your leg can go down anyway. Uh, I'm, that's not what, I, that's, we're not worried about that kind of thing. These bodies aren't fit for heaven. They, are, they aren't going to be there. There needs to be a change. 1 Corinthians 15 talks about that. But in Philippians chapter 3, it does as well. And that's right next door in our passage here. And I want to go back. I want to go back and, and think about this idea of glory. He says, we will appear with him in glory. Now, the disciples saw the Lord Jesus Christ in all his glory. They got glimpses of that. But the reality that we will, we will not only see that, we will share in that. And so picking up, um, picking up in verse 19, oops, excuse me, went to the wrong side here. Picking up at the end of verse 19, notice these enemies of the cross, verse 18, they set their minds on earthly things. Similar wording to our passage. And he says, for our citizenship is in heaven from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body. Now, we ought to be eagerly waiting the, the coming of the Lord. It ought to be just something that, yes. And as we read our passage in Colossians, when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, I mean, our life is wrapped up, so will we appear with him in glory. That ought to just be, yeah, come, Lord Jesus. That ought to be what, what, what gets to us. But he says here, he's going to transform our lowly, our bodies of our humility, that it might be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things. It's going to be conformed to the body of his glory. The disciples got a view of that when Jesus walked into the room in his resurrected body. He was just boom. They got a view of that when he walked on water. They got a view of that in several other things, in particular as he, was, as he was raised up into heaven. They got a view of that, of that kind of a glory. But the reality is for us, our bodies, these bodies we live in will be transformed into a body like his, a resurrection type body. And that's the hope and that's the reality that's the reality for us. We died, we were buried, we were raised with Christ. That's our position. Now, now what? How does that impact us? And we're in this, this spot, we just have great hope and encouragement. We saw that we ought to be seeking things above and thinking things above. And it all comes back to our theme idea. Is Christ one to you? Are you responding to what God has done for you? This position he has given you, are you responding with, is Christ one to you? When he is, I think he'll be seen in you because you're hidden in him. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for the truth that we have of our position in Christ. We thank you that it gives such great assurance. We thank you too that it gives motivation and encouragement to put you first and allow you to be seen in and through us for your glory. In Christ's name, amen.